Thank you, girls. I tell you, I appreciate people who use their gift for the Lord. Amen? Amen. Music, teaching, any other way, we can just do what the Lord wants us to do. And that's a joy I know in His life, and I praise the Lord for it. Well, I want to welcome you to a new year. We're in the first Sunday of that new year. It's always an exciting time, so let me say Happy New Year. Some have had a great year, some have had a hard year, but you know, we have a new year. Nothing you can do about it, it's a new year, amen? It just comes around once a year. One of the things I've noticed already, though, is that there have been those individuals that uh, print magazines, and already you're beginning to see magazines come out with their pictorials about the events of 2017. Saw some recently. And they talk about all the events that have happened. They talk about the people who have died, a whole TV. You know, it's amazing they can do a whole TV show on people that have died in the, in the area of movies and etc. I guess it just means people are getting older. Amen? Amen. Happens. Well, you know, it's amazing. Not only do they have articles about what's happened the previous year, but they have predictions for the future. And there'll be those predictions that go out 10, 20, 30 years, even more. And you read about those. Always, those fascinate me. Back when I was in seminary, we got to talk about it in class one day because they had come out in 1967 at New Year's, and there was this big prediction. And I kept that material because I thought, I wonder if this will be true, because I thought, boy, this will be great. Listen to the prediction that came. The experts predicted that by the turn of the century, 2000, Technology would have taken over so much of the work we do through robotics and all kinds of stuff like that, that the average American would work, the average American work week would be only 22 hours. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? I mean, just think, 22 hours of work. And that we would work only 27 weeks a year. And the problem that we would be having is, what to do with all of our leisure time? Were they wrong? I don't know about you, but being a preacher was more than 40 hours a week. <laughs> you know, uh, 27 weeks a year, that's a lot of vacation. So what I'm saying simply is the fact that we really can't truly predict that many years out exactly in lots of different details. But the thing I know is that Many times people can predict, but they miss the mark. That's why it's important for you and I to be sure we ground our life in this Word. Because the Lord does not predict, He does not prophesy anything that He's not going to fulfill. So it's very important for us to remember that. You know, we are very busy people. We walk fast. Margaret sometimes will tell me, slow down, would you? We walk fast. We eat fast. Some of my family, they can eat before I can even get my food. You know, isn't that amazing? That happens in families. I mean, we're just the people that are busy about doing things. Have you ever heard this? You're about eating and all of a sudden they say, excuse me, i got to run. It happens. I'd kid our staff. Uh, I'd say, I don't know about you people, but I've got work to do. It means we need to be about something. We have tasks that are going before us. So here on this first Sunday in 2018, I wonder what we'll do in this year. Will we be busy? I would say yes. That's a pretty good prediction. That's pretty normal for most people. Will we make better use of our time? 365 days. That time will come to an end. Many of us will see that. Will we look back with joy or with regret? Life is not fair. It is not just. So we're going to have to deal with all kinds of things in 2018. Will we look forward, will we as the future of this church look forward with anticipation, excitement, expectation, or with dread? There's a passage I want to focus on this morning. You'll find it in Ephesians, the fifth chapter if you want to turn over there. The fifth chapter of Ephesians begins and he says, and it's a very good thing for us, he says, imitate Jesus Christ. Imitate Jesus Christ. Our focus passage is the 15th verse and following. You'll see it there on the screen. Be very careful then how you live. You'll notice there on the screen it says walk. That's a, 
one translation that many have. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. That whole chapter, and of course, the book of Ephesians is God's presentation to us about how to live our life. You know, if you want to learn how to live your life, study the prison epistles. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Study that. God teaches us how to live every single day of our life. So, out of this passage, I think there's some important lessons for us to learn today. Very important lessons. Those lessons are things I I hope you'll take notes. That you'll look over these. You'll reflect on them. Because, first of all, our time on earth is limited they say that's such a great profound statement boy you must be smart our time on this earth is limited we've had deaths of those who are beyond the 80s this week those who are beyond uh, just barely beyond 40s we've had those die this week uh, tragically the man that drowned in the pond was uh, some of our closest friends brother-in-law and so there's all kind you never know all kinds of situations in life. Be careful how we live because why? Because our time on this earth is limited. You do not know the days of your life. Now the Lord does, not because you're a puppet, but the Lord is not bound by time. And so he says, be mindful of this. The psalmist puts it this way. Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. Do you understand how precious life is? You know, I, I can really say to you, I never really understood that till I became a chaplain at Hillcrest. I mean, I'd lived my life as a teenager and went to college, went to seminary and all those kinds of things. I was just about busy living life. But when I became a chaplain, all of a sudden, every day I was confronted with the brevity of life. How life is so limited. Be called to the emergency room because two teenagers were driving and they were drinking. And because of their drunk driving, they go off the road, hit a telephone pole, and they both die. Now I'm dealing with the families of a person of color family and a person of an Anglo family color. You know, it's amazing. All of a sudden, every day, I was faced with the reality, this world is not fair. This world has a limited time for everyone. Our choices have a lot to do with that very thing. Someone asked the other day, do you think it was God's will someone fall through the ice? I think God knew exactly. But I don't think we're puppets. God's will is that we do that which He leads us to do. We need to learn how to deal with life as it really is. The psalmist goes on, he says, the length of our days is 70 years or 80. If we have the strength, they quickly pass and we fly away. Psalms 90.10. 70 or 80 years. Some of you have reached that. Amen? We're thanking the Lord for it. Now, some of these younger folks, can you remember? I remember. I have a good memory. Sometimes. Not often, but I have a good memory. But I remember when, as a teenager, then I went into college, and in seminary, I remember thinking being 40 years of age, that was ancient. Do you remember that? And you look back and it's just gone. Where did the 40s go? Where did the 50s go? You know? I'm going to enjoy my 60s. Oh, I did enjoy those, didn't I? Okay. I'm going to enjoy my 70s. Time is fleeting. And we need to understand those very things. People Magazine, a few years back, published an article and they called it Dead, D-E-A-D, Dead Ahead. And it told about a new clock that had been designed to keep track of how much time you had left to live on earth. You know they didn't sell out. (laughs) You know, it was an article about it. And it was this clock that you would set, and you would set your age in it, and at that time they were predicting that the average life for a woman was uh, 80, and for a man was 75. Okay? Okay? Now, today, the latest thing I'd seen is 79 uh, for us men, 84 
for the women. And so you just put your age in and they extend it out. And so you could look every day and see how much longer you got to live. Ninety nine, ninety nine, hundred bucks. You know, you never hear much about that. The thing of it is, we need to understand. God says to us, "We need not count on tomorrow, because tomorrow may not come. Life can be gone quickly. All you have now, I want you to think about that. Is the time you have right now." And the choices you make today are important for your future. When we think in terms as if this day is not significant because I've got tomorrow, or I've had all these days and I bank on my tomorrow because I've had all my past, we miss what God may be saying to us. Our time on this earth is valuable. And it's very limited. second lesson I think we learn is that make the most of every opportunity. Paul tells us that we must, what? Make the most of every opportunity. Look at that. Make the most. In other words, you're going to have opportunities going to come your way. And he says, when they come your way, don't miss them. Don't misconceive what God's up to. But understand, make the most of it. Because what? We have an enemy. Some of us were talking Last week, and I said, I think one of the greatest challenges that the average Christian has is to really believe we're in warfare. Are you a warrior? See, we don't think that mindset so much because we live in a very comfortable nation. We live in a time in which we can get along in life without a lot of conflict at times, perhaps, with other people or with institutions or whatever. But he comes to remind us, Satan is a robber and a thief. And one of the greatest tools that Satan has is to rob you of your time. Think about it. Time is precious. And if Satan can rob you of some time, then he's won the battle. Not the victory, but the battle. You know what a waste of time is? Sin. Sin is a waste of time. But it's pleasurable I mean, it's something that captivates us. It's something that it's hard to get away from sometimes. But one of the ways is that Satan will rob us is to just tempt us in such a way we give in. You do not have to give in to sin if... You know, the Bible's filled with these prepositional statements that says they're conditional. If is a conditional preposition. If... If, if, if the Holy Spirit is alive in you, which means you're a believer, you don't have to give in to sin. I already have a way of escape. That's the promise of God. Every time I'm tempted to sin, the Bible says what? The Holy Spirit said, I've already made a way of escape. You know what your escape hatch is? If you have a particular area that you're tempted in, you know how the Holy Spirit's already made you a way of escape? Learn. Because He says, That is how Satan will try to rob us. You know, when I think about how we perceive things so differently, I was talking about, you know, our time on earth is so limited. And things change in our perspective of things, doesn't it? You remember when Margaret and I were dating, uh, she lived out in the country. You know, in West Texas, what the country is? They just don't have telephone poles. (laughs) Many of them. We all got mesquite bushes. But when we started dating, we could go out, and when we'd come back, we could sit and talk in the car out there for an hour or two, and it seemed like just a blink of a moment. I mean, we we had so much to talk about, and it was so exciting to be with each other. And then we became parents of teenagers, and that hour or two that they were sitting talking in that car was a time of anxiety. Why are they out there so long? It changes, doesn't it? And so... It's important for us to understand that God says our time's limited and we need to take advantage of every opportunity that He presents to us because we don't want to miss what the Lord's up to. Sometimes, even good things make demands on our lives. Good things. You remember the story of Mary and Martha and Jesus comes to see them? 
Martha gets upset, doesn't she, because Mary's not helping in the kitchen preparing for those that come into their home. And that was a very much a natural part. It was expected of you. If you had a guest in your home, you take care of them, feed them, and etc. And so Martha's upset at Mary because Mary is missing the opportunity to fix the meal for Jesus and disciples. And she complains. And Jesus said to her, Martha, Martha, you're missing the opportunity. I appreciate, was it sin for her to be cooking the meal? No, it was not sin. But you know, she missed the opportunity of having God in her presence. You understand that? Sometimes we need to realize that God wants us simply to show up and be in His presence. And in doing that, we're going to be blessed in a very, very special way. He said to Martha this in Luke 10, You are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. You know what Satan can't rob you of? Uh, Listen closely. He cannot rob you of the Holy Spirit being in your life as a Christian. Yes, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can quench the Holy Spirit. You can make God sad because of disobedience and sin in your life. But you know what? There's nowhere in Scripture that says that Satan can take the presence of God out of your life. You understand how important that is? That means no matter where you find yourself, the bottom of the pit, up on the mountaintop spiritually, the Holy Spirit is there. We have to take every opportunity to be in His presence and to worship and to celebrate what He's up to. Sometimes we just get caught up in the here and now because it's important. But Jesus is dealing with things in eternal perspectives. We need to remind ourselves Not everything will last forever. Not everything will last forever. It's important for us to realize it's sometimes the common, simple things that can cause problems. There was an illustration by Richard Swinson. He was a medical doctor and he wrote a book in which he discussed one of the major uh, maladies of our life and he talked about anxiety and stress. And he said one of the things he'd seen in his practice that caused so much anxiety and stress in people's lives, which also, listen to me, caused medical problems. Listen to me. One of the, many of the lectures we had there in the chaplaincy were from uh, medical doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists, theologians, all kinds of people. You know what was really interesting? None of them disagreed on this fact. Your mental condition, the way you think, the way you respond mentally has a direct effect upon your physical health. Isn't it interesting? The studies have shown that if you pray or people pray for you when you're sick in the hospital, those people are four times more likely to go out of the hospital well than others. Four times. That came out of a Boston University study. So what's he saying to all of us in this? He's saying people are overloaded. That was his evaluation. Stress and anxiety because of overload. Sometimes we're overloaded with commitments. You ever need to stop and analyze your commitments? You got all kinds of commitments sometimes. Make sure God has given those commitments to you. Yeah, in the church, we want you involved. We want you busy. We want you doing things that God leads you to do. Evaluate your commitments. See if God is saying you need to lay this aside. He says lay aside the sin that so easily entangles you. You realize sometimes our overcommitment could be a sin because we may be missing time with God. I'm so busy, I don't have time to be in the presence of God. I don't have time to worship. Overload with possessions. I've had to repent. You know, I'm one that doesn't like to throw away things. Amen. So I have all kinds of accumulation of things. Mark has been after me to clean out my clothes closet, and I need to. So I did one side. And I asked the Lord to forgive me, because some people can use all those shirts I had a lot more than me, because I, I couldn't even see some of them. Amen. 
An overload of possessions. Get rid of a lot of things. I may have told you once, but one of the young men that made a difference in our church years ago was the fact when all of a sudden one day God said, you've got an overload of possession and it's called a bass boat. He sold his bass boat. You know, I'd preached to this young man and his family for years. There's nothing I could say, but you know one day when he came in from the lake and he turned to go to his home pulling his bass boat and his wife and three children were turning to go to church that Sunday morning, God said, where is your priorities? You're overloaded with possessions. You don't need this. Now, he still fishes and etc., but guess what? It doesn't drive his life. Sometimes also we overload in the area of work. The workplace. Are you overloaded at the workplace? You get up early, you fight traffic, you do all these kinds of things, you make all these decisions, and there's no time for God, for family, for leisure. You know, I can't look into your heart of your life. I have no idea. Sometimes people are not working enough. Some of you are just working 22 hours a day, amen? Oh, not a day. A week. 27 weeks a year. You know, who's that person? So it's important for us to understand. Sometimes there's just that overload. You know what? One of the greatest overloads today that's a reality is the overload of information. Isn't it amazing what's going on today in the world in which we live? I can ask Siri, or I can ask Echo. Is that what it is? Or whatever. Alexia? I can ask that. Somebody gave us one of those brain cells for Christmas. How in the world can you ask Sirius, Syria, or whatever, Alexia, and in less than five seconds they tell you something? That's an overload of information because it must be hanging in every molecule of the universe. Because how can they get it so quick? I don't understand that. But sometimes there's so much information that we never have time to do anything. I need a little more insight. I need a little more understanding. So, just be mindful of that. So, in summarizing, what am I saying in all that? There's so many demands on your time. There's so many good things that can be done. But remember, there's only 8,760 hours in 2018, and we've already got several of them behind us. Think about it. How important it is that we listen to the Holy Spirit and be guided by the Lord. Thirdly, I'd say to you, understand what the, the Lord's will is. What is the Lord's will? What do you think the Lord's will is for you this year? You think He wants you to work on being an imitation of Him? Ephesians 5 says, imitate Jesus. You ever thought about one of your goals ought to be more like Jesus? Become more like Jesus. Think more like Jesus. Demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, which is the characteristics of Jesus. Let me give a few suggestions that I believe might be the God's will for you today, this year. First of all, establish your priorities. You say, preacher, that's not biblical. Well, I think it is. Because the Lord says to us, we need to learn how to put the first things first. We need to how to put the most important things first. You know, we have a website at Baptist General Convention that you can get involved called My316. And you can use it on what's the most important thing that's happened to you. It's a, where you can put your testimony. The most important thing that happened to me is when I was 14 years of age, I responded to the call of the Holy Spirit for me to be saved. Gave a testimony. Think about it. Think about what God wants to say to you. Establish your priorities. In other words, who or what is most important in your life? Who or what's most important? How do we govern that? How do we discern that? One of the ways is that we have to be honest with ourselves and ask ourselves, where do we invest our time? That will tell us a great deal of what's most important in our life. Some people look at their life and 
their time is consumed by the yard work or the housework or the work at the business or it's consumed by uh, social activities or auxiliaries or whatever. Look and see where you're putting a lot of time and ask yourself, is this the most important thing that God would have me be involved in? I hope you will seriously answer the question, my relationship with God through Jesus Christ is most important to me. Why has God asked you to give the tithe off the first instead of the last? Because He's talking about your heart condition. Why is He asking us always to give Him the best and the, the first as you study throughout all the Bible? Because the Lord is wanting us to understand that the most important thing in our life is Jesus Christ and our relationship to Him. You'll need to establish some time in your priorities, I think, to pray and to read His Word. To be in His Word. To pray and be in His Word. That's important. I've mentioned to you before, you'll hear it again as long as the Lord lets me be here. You need to get your prayer journal. Write down your prayers. See, record when you see God answering them. Pray, ask the Lord. Find His will. Pray, believing. He says it will be answered unto you. Think about that. Pray for our missionaries. Pray for those that you don't know, but God knows them and He's asking for people to lift them up in prayer. You must spend time with your family. I know some of you have family here in the church. Some may have family many miles away. Spend time with your family. I want to extend that beyond just your nuclear family, just beyond your immediate family. I want to encourage you to spend time with your church family. You know, December was a great month for me being here as a new person. You know why? We had some great fellowships. We had singing on Sunday night and we'd do fellowships. That was great because it gives us a chance to talk to each other. It gives us a chance to know one another. I know more how to pray for some of you than I did eight weeks ago. Spend some time with your family. Don't take it for granted that we're going to be here next year. Spend time with family. Spend time, and by that I'm talking about your wife, your children. Now I know some of you don't have a spouse. Spend time with your family. You're valuable. God has left you here to be an influence in people's lives. Find ways to influence. Grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Find ways to influence neighbors, those around you. Priorities. Honor the Lord in your workplace. That's important, folks. You know, one of the greatest tools that Satan uses is for a person to say, I'm a believer and act like Satan in the workplace. That's devastating. When people have a rotten attitude at work, when people have no respect for others, when people have a work environment in which they are allowing Satan to get the victory and all of that, and then people know that they're believers, that's not, that doesn't sink. So in 2018, honor the Lord in your workplace. Maybe your workplace is your home. Honor Him there. What can we do to demonstrate that Christ is alive in our life? So I'm saying establish your priorities. It's important for us to do that. Learn how to live today. Think about it. What are you going to do today that will honor the Lord? How are we going to do that? I'd encourage you to come back tonight. Give us an hour of your time. Because why? Because the Bible says there's wisdom in many minds. That means one person or a few people can't really have the clear picture of what God wants to do in a church, in a ministry. You know, why do ministries have to have board of directors? Because one or two people can't totally discover the mind of Christ. And it takes those around them. Learn how to live today. Don't live with regrets for things in the past. Don't live with anxiety of what's going to happen to you. Well, where am I going to go to college? You know, who's going to like me? Who's going to... Uh, the, what kind of profession? The anxiety of the future. Live for the day with confidence. This is the day the Lord hath made. I will choose to rejoice and be glad in it. 
I've worked with many people through the years, and some I've encountered, they engage in a game. There's a book written many years ago called Games People Play. It's a great, interesting book. But they talk about a game, I wished it were. I wished it were next week. I wished it were next month. Or some say, as the kids go to school and say, boy, I wish this day were over. This day will never end. I wish, I wish. Well, Gary Freeman uh, tells about a girl who went to college and she just hated it. But she told herself, if I can ever get out of college and get married and have children, I know I'll finally be able to enjoy life. I want you to listen. I'm going to read to you what he wrote. I thought it was interesting. So she stuck with it. She went to classes every day and finally graduated from college. Then she got married and had children and discovered that children are a lot of work. Amen? Do you have an amen? All right. So she told herself, if I can just get these kids raised, then I'll be able to relax and enjoy life. About that time, the kids were entering high school. Her husband said, guess what? We don't have enough money to send our kids to college. I guess you'll have to get a job. Well, she didn't want to, but she knew he was right and they needed the money, so she went to work. And she hated it, but she told herself, if I can just get these kids out of college and get all the bills paid, then I can quit work and really enjoy life. Finally, the last child graduated from college. All the bills were paid. So she walked into the employer's office and said, I quit. Oh, you don't want to quit now. If you stay with us just another eight years, you'll have a pension for the rest of your life. She thought, well, I don't want to work another eight years, but there's all that money there, and I really don't, uh, I can't turn down that opportunity. So the, she worked another eight years, and finally she and her husband retired at the same time. They sold their home, and they bought a little retirement college, cottage. Then they sat down on the swing on their front porch and looked at the family picture album and dreamed about the good old days. <laughs> he, pretty, he writes a lot of truth, doesn't he? You know, I put this on the screen because I want, and it's in your notes, but I want you to really think about this statement. It's not original with me. Life is what happens to you while you are making plans to do something else. Now folks, 2018, you can't control everything that's going to happen. God doesn't want you to. But you can look at these things we've talked about today and make this the year that will honor the Lord and will do great things. Another author put it this way. I don't know if I agree with all of it. I want you to listen. During this new year, may you have enough happiness to keep you sweet, enough trials to keep you strong, enough sorrow to keep you human, enough hope to keep you happy, enough failure to keep you humble, enough success to to keep you eager, enough friends to give you comfort, enough wealth to meet your needs, enough enthusiasm to make you look forward to tomorrow, and enough determination to make each day better than the day before. Lord, please help us to use these hours of 2018 in the wisest way we possibly can. I want you to just listen as I close with Romans 13, 11, and 12. Listen. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is near, nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. That's God's Word to us. He's simply reminding us, folks, we don't even know when Jesus is coming back. We don't know when we're going to stand before Jesus on the Bema seat of judgment and give an account of all of our deeds, good and bad. Now, by grace we're saved through faith in Him. We're sealed. But you know, it's important for us to understand what we do with our life is valuable to you and to the kingdom. 
Each one of us in this room influences people. Let us influence them to be more like Jesus because we want to be and we have as a goal to be more like Jesus. 2018. Wise living is a choice. It's your choice. Father, I pray today you'll help us understand what it means to live in such a way that we will honor you. Thank you, Jesus, that you're so concerned with each of us in this room, no matter what age we are, that you speak to our heart, and we thank you for it. In the wonderful, wonderful name of Christ, who seals us, we pray. Amen.